So, um, hi everybody on the internet. Uh, apparently, suffering some brain damage at the moment. Enjoy the ride. Um, we were starting talking about monopolies the other day, and we had to talk an interesting amount about them. The characteristics what we have is there's only one company doing it, and there's nothing like it. And part of the reason why there's nothing like it is because it's hard to do. That's these first three bullet points. So, since there's nobody else doing it, the company gets to set the price that they're going to sell it for, and they have all the power if they want to change where they sell it, change how they make it, what color that it is, all that kind of stuff. They've got the control because what else are you going to do? Because there's nothing close. So, you can either buy it from us or you've got nothing. Um, and they really don't need to do much advertising at all. Any advertising they would do would be informative. You know, I, we exist, and we, that's where we were finishing the other day. Like the local electric company, you don't see billboards come and buy our electricity. When you buy a house, you'll see a sticker on top of the power meter with the 800 number that you're supposed to call for them to book up your service. That's about all the advertising they do. If it is a luxury product and you're the only company doing luxury product, well, you would be getting into other advertising because you've got to do the informative advertisement of, hey, we exist, hey, this is what the product is, but then you also got to get into that persuasive of, you know that you want it, kind of thing. So you've got to start building that argument, getting that presence in people's mind. But your local electric company, your local radio station, well, like radio station, not normally. Um, and generally speaking, you know, a true monopoly isn't going to have to be advertising for their monopoly products. When was the last time you saw an advertisement for Microsoft Office? They don't really advertise it, right? Because pretty much they know you're going to get a computer, what's the first thing you're going to get? If it ain't got Office on it, you're going to either buy it or illegally download a copy of it somewhere, you know, from the right? Right? They have a free version of the store, so. Yeah, as college students, y'all got the free version of all the 365. Y'all have access to it. They had it on the store, on the Microsoft store. He goes, correct. Oh, yeah. Oh, on the Microsoft App Store that I like never go to. Trial. It's yeah. It's it's either the trial version, it's shrink down equivalent that they have on Android app, that Android tablets, and that phone, and that kind of stuff. But you know, I have Word document on my phone here. It's not at all what you get. It can open it, but that's about the extent of it. Uh, so there, there, and there, there's an interesting, there's a Chrome extension for those of you who use Chrome that will let you open and edit Microsoft Office documents. But I, when I have But anyway, and then first thing I do is convert it to a Google Docs. So, did you have a question? Yeah, but why do you love, why do you dislike Microsoft so much? Oh. Uh, we go with the, uh, I know, it's just, <laughs> I believe in freedom. I believe in <coughs> control. To a certain extent, control. Microsoft doesn't give you that. Going back to the, they act like they're monopoly, whether they are or whether they're not. You keep that Microsoft, that Windows 10 on there, and you're going to keep installing crap on there, and installing crap on there, and installing crap on there, and you've got no choice because you signed up and you were suckered into the you game. Know, oh, okay, I'm going to go with Windows 10 instead of Windows 7 now. And now you're trapped and they keep installing software whether you want it or not. They install bloatware and the, the software is huge. I got a limited amount of internet at the house, and it, it, next thing I know, Microsoft, ding, we just downloaded, update, and burned up all of our high-speed data, because it once you got a sniff of, hey, you're, you know, working better, faster than two megabit per second speed, for that two days of the month that we actually have the good speed before we burn through our 10 gigs with the best data, sucks on the internet, on the satellite internet, and you can't turn it off. If I mean, you want your computer wired into your network, but just cable is more yes. is faster, more efficient, or more reliable than Wi-Fi. But you cannot go in there and tell Microsoft uh, only do the downloads at night between midnight and six o'clock in the morning when they then count against my bandwidth gap. You can't do that. You can't do that. Nope. 
They used to be able to, but they didn't like it because they want you to. They want to be putting crap on their computer or whatever. Because they're like, well, if you somebody tells us only go tonight, and then they turn their computer off at night, then we're never going to be able to get our tentacles into them. And then this. So, and the only way you can almost do it, which is the wrong way to do it, which is what we do, because um, I haven't quite got my lovely bride using Linux, but that project is going to be happening next week. But you got you got to go to Wi-Fi. Unplug the wire and use a Wi Fi connection. So that just cuts your speed in half on your network. And then you call it a meter connection, and then it won't download anything, including updates to the antivirus program. And you can't just, even if you say, okay, it's a meter connection, but then when I manually go in and say, hey, download antivirus updates, guess what doesn't happen? Because Microsoft. That kind of thing. So, so and, and Apple does kind of the same kind of stuff. That's why I don't do an iPhone ring. I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, but I want to wipe out the software. I want to put something else on there. I can do it. Android, I want to wipe out the software, put something on I can do it. You know, so I got control on what's on my phone, what's not on my phone, what's on my computer, what's not on my computer. I don't want to go back and read the the next day because it's a desktop computer. Why does that phone app need to be on the desktop computer? I'm just saying. And it's on here. I can't. Uh, I'm, unless network service people really did a good job cleaning this thing out when they were they created their image, the phone app is probably on this computer here in front of this classroom. Okay. Those of you following along at home, I'm sorry. Blame Will. This email address is oh. <laughs> okay. We kind of have seen some of these things, but I'm just laying out some definitions for you OCD people because OMG. And, uh, uh, the market power is the ability to alter the price and characteristics of the good or service. Microsoft, they have control because what are you going to use if you don't use Windows on your desktop? Most of y'all are suckered into, well, I got to use Windows, and so then they put whatever they want on it. They, they want to put Candy Crush on your computers. They put the whatever the Xbox player. Yeah, okay, it may just be a little live tile, but then I get software on there, but every time you delete it, you come back a couple weeks ago, it's there again. Skype, go visit and bring it back. They can do that kind of stuff. Terrible of the pen. And a virus. I realize that they do do that. Yeah, and just because they're not as evil as they used to be. Now that Sachi Nadella is running a company as opposed to Steve Ballmer, they're a little less evil. I will give them that. They're, they're not Facebook evil, but they're still pretty kind of evil there. Facebook is evil there, but anyway, oh, James. I, I'm, I, I, I apologize already. I apologize again. I'm sorry if they're not here. They're doing us again. Yeah, uh, I'm just kidding. No, I'm apologizing for what's going on in my brain. But anyway, but they can change. They can make changes if they want. Uh, Facebook. They kind of a little bit said it got themselves a monopoly because it's like, oh, well, everybody's going to be on Facebook. Why? Because everybody's on Facebook. You want to connect with your friends? Well, where's your friends? They're on Facebook. So you got to join Facebook too. Or you don't connect with your friends. Join a rebellion. Just say no. That's what I did. Delete your Facebook account. I dare you. I'll give you a quarter. But of course, you can't delete your Instagram account too. And then you need to go back and flush all your browser cookies and that kind of stuff on your browser because even though you're not a Facebook, even though you're not a Facebook <laughs> user, you go to a Facebook page and you know it comes in and you want to look at whatever, and then they're like, well, you gotta log in. But just because you went there, Facebook is still put cookie on your computer and tracking the rest of your surfing that you're doing on the internet. Even you are not a Facebook user. They know where you're going on the internet. And what are you going to do about it? Because they're Facebook. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> you are very passionate. Yes. Just say no. That's the, that, that, that's my motto. Just say no. Um, Okay. So, 
Remember, the domain curve for any product, this could be downwardly sloping. But then we talked about the domain curve for a pure competition company was flat because it, their domain curve is based on the when you drive your truck up to Kellogg's, they're going to be buying however much you got in the truck, right? So whether you bring in one bushel, 10 bushels, 100 bushels, 1,000 bushels, they're still paying $3 a bushel, so your domain curve is flat. Whereas for a monopoly, the domain curve is downwardly sloping. For the monopoly, the domain curve that the company is facing is the demand for the product. Because the company is the product. You know, with a corn farmer, it's just one farmer is making one one thousandth of the corn that's being grown. Monopoly is making 100% of whatever it is that's being made. So your and my demand for the monopoly product is the demand for the monopoly product, and that is the demand that the monopoly company is facing. Your and my demand for electricity, for those of you that live in Mecklenburg County, for those of you that live in Mecklenburg County, the demand for your electricity is the demand that the Mecklenburg Electric Co-op is facing. All right? You see the difference there? Because all the demand is their demand. So how does it go with damages? So how does what? How does it go with damages? Oh, downwardly sloping because if Mecklenburg Electric Co-op raises their prices, we're going to be like, ooh, electricity's getting expensive. Y'all be sure to turn lights off and don't run the TV as much. And we'll use less electricity. Maybe some of us like to start firing our candles. But if Mecklenburg Electric Co op lowers their prices, then we're like, dude, electricity's cheap. Lights on all the time. Because I don't want to risk stuff on my toe. Just so I can save a penny. Right. So the, the demand is good. We'll, we'll be moving up and down that demand curve based on what they do with the price. And their demand curve is for the company that is the total demand curve of the customer because they are the only game doing it. So, since the market demand curve is their demand curve, they have the option of deciding, okay, this is our customer's demand for electricity. Where on this curve do we want to play? They have the choice of saying, well, we can go cheap and sell a whole bunch of electricity. We can go expensive and sell not a whole lot of electricity, but we have that freedom because we ain't got to work by competition. If we raise our prices, doesn't matter. If we lower our prices, doesn't matter. Competition isn't an issue. So we can decide do we want to be a cheap electric company or do we want to be a luxury electric company. It's all up to us. Does that make sense to you? Intuitively, where on the demand curve do they want to pl play, and which is basically dictating what price do they want to charge? And so, okay, I don't want to hear you. Oh. So the question is, where do you want to do it? I don't know if y'all remember. Maybe the second week of class. Maybe I did it in this class. Maybe it was back in two hundred one, back in August. They're going to sit here and do what? They're going to say at uh, 20 cents per kilowatt hour, oh, we'd only sell at 15 cents, we'd sell 30 million at 10 cents, we'd sell 60 million. Now, I'm going to use revenue, not profit, just to keep it simple. But they can just sit there and do the math and which one is going to pay us the most. Ten of them at 20 apiece, how much would they be bringing in? What? 30 of them at 15, how much would they be bringing in? 450. 60 of them at 10? 600. Ooh, so what price do they want to charge? $10 or 10 cents. They'll make more money at this point than they would at that point. That's just the way the math works. But it might end up turning out that, the, 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 that their situation is that maybe they ought to be up here. That might be the perfect point. They have that point. They have that choice. Corn farmer, nope. Price is what the price is, that price is whatever their buyer is willing to put. And hopefully they know what that price is in advance so they can adjust their production accordingly. 
which reminds me of something that I should have talked about when you're talking about the farmers and I'm talking about all that mystery they have about taking a guess as to what kind of prices that they're going to be fetching and all this kind of stuff. And you don't know in the spring what price you're going to be selling for in the fall, which we talked about it in a marketing class. You'll be taking next semester. We'll talk about it in the marketing class. The idea is the farmer can know they can do a contract do options, futures contracts, that kind of stuff, so they can sort of pre-sell their crop before they do it. They just do a contract of, so I'm going to deliver my soybeans. I'll, I'll sell them to you for a $3 bushel in September. And they sign every, so they already know what their price is. And so they know well, I'm only going to get $3 bushel, so they can set their production accordingly. So then it takes some of the mystery out of there. Sometimes the price may be the normal price is lower than that, in which case they won. Sometimes the normal price is higher than that, in which case maybe they didn't make as much money as they could have. But by locking in that price, they could secure it. I should have talked about that a week ago, but okay, but I take it that's not very popular. Though. It's not very popular because a lot of farmers don't see the thing easy, but it is fairly easy. But it it really kills them at the time where they're like, I'm sitting there saying everybody else is getting paid $4 for their corn and I'm only getting paid 3 because I signed a stupid contract or whatever stupid person told me to sign a stupid just to get that kind of thing. So, visually speaking, visually speaking, this is what they look like. There is the demand curve downwardly sloping. Supply curve is going to be upwardly sloping. But the secret of what they have is they know, but they should know what the demand curve is. And so once they pick that perfect price, in this case, $3, what they're going to do is just what I just said about the farmer. If I know that the price that's going to make me the most profit is if I'm selling my electricity for three dollars a piece. Then, if I sell my electricity for three dollars a piece, this is how much electricity I'm going to sell. So, guess what? This is how much electricity generating capacity we're going to get. We're going to mold our supply curve to hit the target that we want based on the price we want to charge. If we want to charge a low price. That means we got to crank out a whole bunch of energy. Well, we need to open up two or three power plants, right? So we need to get a supply, make our supply curve out there by getting a second generator, third generator, whatever. But if we want to do the high price, means we're going to be selling high and we're not going to sell a whole lot. Well, maybe we can get away with just a little itty bitty generator instead. So once they get the feel for where the demand is, they set their production according to the demand that they're shooting for and where on a domain curve they want to be. So they can set a line. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, you factor all that stuff. And, and well, we'll I'll get into getting, actually get into the weeds for how they determine how much the price and all that stuff is local. But is this a beautiful place for you to be? Yeah, you get to choose what price you're going to sell, and based on that, you're going to be choosing how much equipment or whatever you're going to use. So what are you going to? You get to choose basically the guarantee the spot's going to make you the most profit. And guess what? Are you going to be making a profit here? Yeah, you're going to be making a profit here because if things don't work out, you raise the price, you lower your price, you do whatever you're going to do. If you come up with a great idea and there is no profit to be made, you ain't going to do it. It's going to go from a monopoly to a oobly. Nobody's doing it. All right. I know what there is a it's zero wobbling, whatever that would be. Uh, if demand is down here, then there ain't no way it can be done. Like the demand for eagle lip soup. Yeah, I'm the only company on the planet making soup out of eagle lips. But the demand is so far, so I can charge whatever price I want to charge my beans soup. But guess what? There ain't no way I'm gonna be able to make money at it, right? So I'm out of there. But if there's any kind of realistic demand, then the profit to be made, they get to choose. And they get to adjust their price. If this year's situation changed, whatever our costs go up, well, we're gonna raise our point, find that new perfect price point that I'm gonna talk about on the next slide, and we're gonna adjust our production accordingly. Make the most profit possible. So 
when farmers were adjusting, they were adjusting their productivity to get the most profit possible based on their limitations. The monopoly is going to set their production to get the most profit possible based on the millions of options or whatever. The, uh, there's a word there that's not limitations that I can't think of. Woohoo. It, it ain't, it ain't unlimited, it's sort of you know, having options. But it's, it's some other word that I can't come up with. I'm not an English major. Yeah, it never was. So here's the thing. So what is a monopoly going to do? They're going to say, well, we want to make most profit possible. So we're going to set the price at the point where we're making the most profit possible. Where the farmer was setting production at the point to get the most profit possible, the monopoly is going to set the price that's going to get the most profit possible, which is kind of going to be determining their production anyway, right? So they're going to come up with a price that's going to they make their production amount to where they make the most profit possible. So they kind of, guess what, are doing the exact same profit maximizing decision ultimately that the farmer has. Even though they have no competition, they follow the same rule. If I can make more money by selling more electricity, I'm going to sell more electricity, I'm going to raise my price, lower my whatever. If I can make more money, I'm going to keep producing. If Making that next kilowatt hour of electricity is going to cost more than I can sell it for. I ain't going to make it. If I can sell a kilowatt for electricity, make more off of it, that's going to cost me to make it. I'm going to make it. Same situation we had when I was exchanging dollars and cents with Josie. All right, they're going to keep milking it and keep producing, adjusting their price, whatever, until their price, which is your marginal revenue, right? Price per kilowatt hour is equal to the extra cost to produce that extra kilowatt hour. Because the cost says, you know, they ramp up. You know, they, they get efficient for a while, but then they start getting expensive because you got to start working your workers overtime and all that kind of stuff. And then once your costs start catching up to your price, then you slow down on doing it. Are you with me? Ultimately, it's the same rule. They have a whole lot more options to play with to get to that rule than a farmer does. The farmer buys your cost market revenue and they just figure out, well, what's the amount? How much corn? How much cows? How much chicken? Of course, if they like the company, they can budge not only how much they produce, but the price that they charge. If they're limited in their production capacity, well, then they, just, they can just raise the price, make more money for doing less, as much as they can for doing money, doing the electricity that they can generate. And then I'll give them extra money that they can use to buy a second generator so they can produce more electricity in the future, and so on. So, when it does settle, it's good to be a monopoly. Okay, I pretty much already said that. Where the marginal cost equals the price, that's determining how much the profit maximizing quantity is, how much you can produce. How many kilowatt hours of electricity do we produce until that extra cost catches up with that extra revenue? And that's where we stop. Well, that's how much we're going to generate. And the advantage is that they can change the price that they charge. Keep a little bit hinted at this. Sometimes raising your price will make you more money, but sometimes lowering your price. We'll make you more money. Remember elasticity? It depends on the elasticity of your product. If the product is fairly inelastic, like electricity, we kind of have to have it, right? So we kind of have to have our electricity. It's like, yeah, there's only so much that we can turn off light bulbs at night to try to save electricity, but we still got to have a heater running so we don't freeze and our pipes don't freeze, right? The refrigerator still got to be running. And we still got to watch TV, right? So, yeah, the, so we're still, even if it, electricity gets expensive, yeah, we'll come back on our electric use, but not a whole lot. So that gives the electric company being set up to, hey, let's jack our prices up. Let's raise our price, raise our price, raise our price, because, okay, yeah, they may come back, but not a whole lot. But we're going to get a whole lot more money out of them for each kilowatt hour that they use. So, right, that would be the case for raising their price to increase their income. Or sometimes, 
lowering their price would increase their income because if the demand is elastic, lowering your price might end up fetching you a whole lot more customers. So, okay, right here depends on the elasticity. So you just create it. And we kind of talked about this. We, we've talked about this before. You're going to have high entry barriers because it's usually, because that's why it's a monopoly. That's why there's only one company doing it because it's making it hard. But unless those barriers are high and stay high, as long as they're high and stay high, the monopoly is going to make a profit, a good profit. But if the barriers get low, if the barriers get lower, then it's going to make it easier for somebody else to come in and compete. Like that patent expires. It suddenly makes it a whole lot easier for another drug company to make a copy of that drug. Now they just got to worry about all the other stuff about the lawsuit threatening and any exclusive deals with Walmart to be the sole distributor of whatever heart medication. And you gotta, but the patent expiring would make it easier. And they do a copy one. Yeah, they would make their own copy, their own version of it. I don't know what I'm saying. Oh, make another drug to do the same thing? Oh, oh, so you, if I, you patent something, you cannot repatent it. Once that patent expires, it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, you can't renew a patent. Can you can like improve it and then? Well, then you can get a patent on your improvement. Okay. Um, so, and it, blah, blah. and I'm trying not to go into copyright in Nicky Mouse, which is actually the thing. Um, I just saw a new one today. You, you, you can improve the product and then you'll have a patent on the improved product but the patent on the original product is still going to be expired. And the it, patent on the improved product isn't going to necessarily cover the original product. So, I'm trying to come up with an example. Does it like Windows 7? Windows 7. Yes, okay, yeah. If Windows 7 had a patent and it expired, that's actually copyright, but okay. But if Windows 7's patent expired, Microsoft can't come back and say, well, you still can't copy Windows 7 source code because it's a whole lot like what we do in Windows 10. But no, the copyright in Windows 10 is covering Windows 10. Windows 7 is still out there. But there's some processes and stuff that might be. And so that's where software is all to do this process, even things like APIs where, you know, your Instagram talks to your open table and talks to your Snapchat, all those eight that kind of is complicated. But yes. So can you set a length of time on a pattern? Or does uh, the government do? The government does it. They have a sort of menu of these kind of products as to how long it can be, those kind of products as to how long it can be. And you can always surrender a pattern. You can say, okay, we're gonna make it open source, give away our source code, give up the pattern. Uh, you can uh, sometimes people will, you know. I'll take my patent and I'll donate to some charity and let them license it out because that's going back to the licensing on the barriers to entry. What, what may have happened? It, like, the, the whole the swipe to unlock for y'all, your older iPhones before y'all finally got fingerprint things. Everybody did the swipe to unlock. Well, Pat, uh, Apple applied for a patent for that. And a lot of people are like, well, uh, duh, that just kind of makes sense. But there's like, no, swipe to unlock. That was kind of nobody was doing swipe to unlock until Apple did swipe to unlock. So if you want to do swipe to unlock, Samsung, then you can take that idea and you can pay Apple for permission to do swipe, swipe to unlock on your phones too. You would license that technology. So then some businesses, so okay, we can license it for you, a dollar a year, something like that. If you basically want to make it free, you can go ahead and make it free, or you can license it. Some companies will donate patents to some charities or that kind of stuff to let them collect the licensing fees as a way to keep the charity float. Um, but if you have a patent, I can't believe I'm here, but okay. You have a patent, you have a copyright, you have a trademark, you have to defend it. Because if people are copying your idea and you don't come up and say, whoa, Mr. 
you don't complain that people are copying your idea. Well, apparently you don't care that people are copying your idea. So if you don't care that people are copying your idea, then you can't come back later and start complaining about it. So if you have a patent, you have a copyright, and you see somebody that is using your idea and ain't paying you for using your idea, you need to go after them. Unless you're okay with them doing that, in which case, let that patent go. And you can go to the do whatever if you had the patent killed or you can just do a thing this is now open source public domain you heard that phrase public domain you, you know, a lot of times see that for cop for written works that kind of stuff going back to copyrights that kind of stuff public domain if a song was written before 1923 anybody can sing it any movies whatever anybody can redo it but books anybody can you can print it anytime it's it's a, before 1923, 1923, I'm pretty sure it's 23, it's a magic year because that's when Mickey Mouse came to be. And Disney is very, very protective of that. And Disney, they pay a bunch of money, a bunch of politicians. So when Mickey Mouse is about ready to go to the public domain, they're Disney's up there, slipping a whole bunch of money, whatever, what, getting the copyright extended. They went from like 20 some odd years, 40 some odd years, 75 years, and it's like, Thank you. Mickey Mouse is probably going to come in public domain in two years. So if the copyright law doesn't change in the next two years, Mickey Mouse comes into public domain, you can draw Mickey Mouse anywhere. You can put Mickey Mouse on your billboards. You can make a, your own Mickey Mouse movie. You can do whatever you want with Mickey Mouse. You can make your Mickey Mouse e-cigarettes, right? To whatever you want to do. Just, because Mickey Mouse belongs to the public. Because dude that came up with the idea, Walt Disney, he had 75 years to make money off of that idea, and guess what? He's dead now, right? The idea is to reward people that came up with the idea, and he's already gotten his reward, right? And he's gone. So now it's just his great grandkids are getting the reward for an idea that he had 75 years ago, kind of thing. And this kind of time when it's like, you'll let it go. Same thing for Happy Birthday, the song. Was actually under copyright protection until finally like two years ago. You couldn't, I mean, yeah, you and I, we sing it every year, right? Multiple times a year. That's fine. But you can't do it on TV, you can't do it on the radio. If you sing, if you sing happy birthday on TV, you sing happy birthday on the radio, you sing happy birthday, you put it in there as part of your rap song or whatever, you sing it, you got to pay well, you had to pay royalties to I can't remember the woman saying that owned the copyright. Yes, which is why a lot of times when you watch these TV shows and stuff, and they're saying stuff, other you go to whatever Applebee's or whatever, and they go around and they, when they come up to the table and they bring you cake and they sing a happy birthday to you, they ain't saying happy birthday to you. They're like, happy happy birthday. We're glad you came to the Chili's. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Bring a margarita or what it's, right, what it's like, whatever the song is that they to sing. Right? It ain't happy birthday to you. Right? Until the last couple of years. So you're saying they're using expand. It can't be extended beyond the law. They can copyright, you know, how Mickey Mouse has changed over time, right? He looks different in the 50s than he did in the 30s. That 1930s version of Mickey Mouse, you can make a copy of it, you can start drawing that 1930s version of Mickey Mouse starting in a couple of years, unless the rules change. But they probably have a separate trademark or copyright on the 1950s version of Mickey Mouse, on the 1970 version of Mickey Mouse, on the 2000 whatever version of Mickey Mouse, so you're not going to be able to copy the modern looking Mickey Mouse, but at this point you can do whatever with the old, old school looking Mickey Mouse starting in a couple of years. But you can't renew it once it's done. Unless the law is changing. Yeah, so is that why the Chuck E. Cheese mouse uh, was different? Don't look the same. Uh, like what commercials? Well, I say, well, it, he couldn't look. He couldn't be Mickey Mouse. Um, and his name's Chuck, so he has to look here. But he's got to be careful that he doesn't look too close to Mickey Mouse. Not about Mickey Mouse, like, like twenty years ago, he looked, he looked like the animation. He looked different, but now on the commercials. Okay. Good. Well, part of that is just more modern graphics to catch the eyes of the oh. kids and that kind of stuff. That's going to be a lot of it. Uh, it's pretty darn cynical. That, uh, we got to change our character every couple of years so we can keep some kind of copyright thing going. Or, but that kind of stuff. 
Change for the sake of change, change for the sake of milking more money out of people. Why do football teams pay for Why do they change logos every two, three years? Change jersey styles every two, three years. Make people buy new jerseys. So are we going to, we're going to change what our cartoon character looks like so we can get another copyright? Plus that's going to make people say, oh, my old Mickey Mouse head is it's the old Mickey, let's get the new Mickey. Are they doing that? So, but uh, but you whatever you do, you can do Mickey Mouse. It looks an awful lot like Mickey Mouse. But you've got to make sure you're avoiding confusion. Because then, if there's a possibility of confusion, what you need your Mickey Mouse, it looks a whole lot like Mickey Mouse, but he just his eyes are crossed or something. I don't know. Um, if people can legitimately see your thing and they're thinking that it's something Disney related when it really isn't, you've caused confusion in the marketplace. Disney will sue you and win. If you cause it and win, if you're causing confusion in the marketplace, and confusion in the marketplace, the Beatles, you know the boys, or dudes, weird haircuts, 60s, drugs. Okay, the Beatles, the music company that the Beatles used, their record label was called Apple. And Steve Jobs, in the 70s, he wanted to do his computer company called Apple. And so he started to do his computer company, Apple, and the Beatles came after Steve Jobs. They're like, no, 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 no. So they had to work out an agreement, and the agreement was, okay, the name Apple is Apple Computer. And that's the name of it, it's Apple Computer, not Apple. Apple computers. And the only way that, it, that and part of that agreement was, yeah, you can be Apple, Apple computer, and we're kind of fine with that as long as you don't do anything that has anything to do with music because then that might cause confusion. You have two people with the name Apple doing music, there's confusion. So then what ended up happening in, oh, I don't know, was it 2004? iTunes! Music. And not just, okay, we're making a music service to, for people that love music, but Apple started paying artists to make music for them. So Apple Computer was acting like a record, a music label. So you have Apple, Apple, two music labels named Apple. And meanwhile, what did Apple do? They're not Apple Computer anymore, right? They're Apple. Right? So, well, so they, they ended up having to do yet a second agreement with Beatles, well, Beatles family, the Thayers, people that own whatever the right. song, like the Apple music and all that kind of stuff. They had to end up doing some kind of second agreement thing, thing, thing. But apparently, they get along just fine because Beatles, Beatles music, especially a few years ago, featured fairly prominently on the iTunes store and that kind of stuff. But you got to avoid confusion. Even though uh, we're a computer company, you're a music company, if there's confusion, there's a problem. If you want to know more about that, take my business law class because I can't believe we just lost 20 minutes to think about all of that stuff. But, uh, okay, so where were we? Before we In went to the BOE school. Yeah, instead of the rabbit hole, the rat hole, the mouse hole, the hole is risky. Okay, so, so here's the thing the electric company, here's where you find us. Okay, we can make a profit. And it's pretty hard for somebody to compete. And the people got to have our electricity. So we can raise our prices, make more money. Raise our prices, make more money. It's hard for somebody to compete. Well, they got to be careful just how high they raise their prices. Because they might accidentally raise their price high enough to where their profit is high enough that somebody can sit there and do the math and say, based on profit going on there, if I get in this game, even though there's all these hurdles I've got to cross, I can afford to do it. Somewhere along the line, somebody can do that math, and then suddenly what happens to monopoly? It ain't a monopoly anymore. Because the second company's gonna come in and do it. It depends. It may, they, and now I've got a slide about this, they have three options on how to do this. Maybe they do it by, uh, Maybe it's worth it for them. They do the math. Look at how expensive electricity is. Well, we'll run our own set of power poles up and down every street in the entire county. We'll run our own set of wires. 
up and down every street in the entire county. We'll have our own power generator, but based on how much money that is being made on electricity, it's worth it. I'm just saying they can't put it next to all the No, no, yeah, so your your power calls are on the right side of the road, by the on the left. Yeah, if the power company's rates get high enough, somebody will figure out a way to do it. Is there a way to do electricity without wires? Solar panels and batteries. Ding, 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 ding. Is there a way to do cable TV without a cable? Uh, direct TV and dish network. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, somebody will find a way to break a monopoly if the profits get high enough. Because doing the same thing isn't the only way to beat a monopoly at, what, at their game. Do something different and come in. Like, oh, like, let's just let, forget about the wires and shoot satellite in space. Forget about the wires, let's put up a little radio tower every three or four miles and forget about home phones. We got cell phones now. Way to beat a monopoly. Is, is, is putting up satellites expensive? Is putting up towers every three or four square miles expensive? Yeah, but if the money being made is high enough, it's worth it. So that brings me back to the, if you're making profit, keep it secret and don't be too carried away. So you do the math on what's the perfect price, but you've got to be looking at what are the barriers to entry and are those barriers slowly getting lower over time? If those barriers are getting lower, it's easier for somebody to come in. You've got to start adjusting your prices. Even if you're the only game in town, you've got to keep your eyes open because people will come up with other options. Maybe they'll do the same thing. Maybe they won't. They'll come up with another way to do it. But as long as you are a monopoly, you are the only game in town, you have the option to discriminate. Price discrimination. To discriminate. The word discriminate, for those of you English majors, the, I can't think of the words where you figure out to where the word came from, lexiconography or something. It's to decide, make a decision here. That's what you're doing when you're discriminating. You're making a choice. Price discrimination, you're making a choice to sell your product to different people at different prices. Generally, well, we think discrimination is bad, right? Most time it is. The discrimination, treating people differently because of some characteristic of person. Gender discrimination, you're treating men differently than women because they're women. Uh, race discrimination, treating somebody differently because of the color of your skin. It's about the person, not the product. Price discrimination is you're charging different people, different prices, the exact same product. And you have the option to do that. It has nothing to do with your cost to produce. It has everything to do with milking. And it wouldn't necessarily do this out of evil. This is all about milking the most money out of people possible. So it's like if Bill Gates wanted to buy a gallon of milk, he would be like $10. I'd be like, okay, because he has the money to do it. But say someone like anybody else, any normal person, yeah, it, yeah, uh, th th that is a form of it. If somebody that, you know, Bill Gates comes rolling these stores, you're sitting there in the grocery store and you see somebody pulling up a Lamborghini, you're getting at prices and you're jacking prices up right quick, right? And then when they leave, you take the stickers down, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. For people in fancy Italian cars, well, it's $12 a gallon for your gas because we, you, we don't want you to be buying that cheap commoner gas that you price the Italian performance car. That, 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 that is the light of culture. There's a joke I'm not going to go there, but anyway. So does that mean like they're wholesaling to sell on Samsung, you're selling all these what you say out with cheaper price and you're selling like separate stores? Maybe. Uh, I mean, in a way, yeah. Part of that is the bulk discount thing, but part of that is, well, you know, because if they may buy it from somebody else. Oh, let's go with an example here of a senior citizen discount. That is price discrimination. Senior citizen discount. You walk into a movie, your grandma walks into the movie. Y'all gonna be watching the exact same movie, right? 
sitting in the exact same kind of chairs, not the exact same period, we'll be beside each other, right? You'll be sitting in the same chairs, watching the same movie, she paid differently than you did. You leave there and you go to the restaurant and you order a hamburger, she orders a hamburger. You get the exact same food in the exact same restaurant, you're paying differently than she's paying because the senior says the discount. They're charging her differently because they're looking at what if just here we are. This might sound bad, but okay, this is the thing here. Like, okay, old people, fixed income, people over 65, a lot of them are retired, a lot of them are on social security, and a social security check ain't a whole lot. So if you are retired and have high health care expenses and you don't have much money, how likely are you to go to a movie? Not very. How likely are you to be going out to a restaurant? Not very. So, well, maybe if we give you a discount, maybe more of you will come to our restaurant. We might not, not make as much profit off of you, but we'll make some off of you. And something is better than nothing. Because otherwise, if you ain't there, nothing. So what it is, it's about targeting those people that are willing to pay full price, make them pay full price. Finding the people that aren't willing to pay full price, and instead of taking nothing from them, offer them a lower price. Like, uh, I'll be honest, like, don't want to go moving. Like, when, well, I guess there's another Star Wars movie coming out this December. Okay, that's like me, my wife, two kids. So that's what, $30 worth of tickets right there. And then popcorn and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, we ain't going on no Friday night to go watch that movie. When are we going? When are we going to go? If we go, it's going to be the Saturday afternoon matinee. So uh, my kids aren't in the same theater with y'all. And uh, when y'all are there on a Friday night on your dates, not paying attention to the movie, you know who you are. My kids ain't going to be there experiencing that. And I'm getting them in there. The only reason why we're doing that is because it's $4 to pop in the matinee. So it's only going to cost us $20 to go there instead of $35 or $40 to go there. Because I ain't going to pay $40 for my family to go see that movie when I can wait a couple months and buy the DVD. For less money and watch it more than once. So here's here's the I call this writing the demand curve. Let's go with go with Star Wars movie. Y'all got those people. Feel free to admit it and oh you know somebody? A Star a serious Star Wars version. I used to be oh I don't know. Ted used to be until the news came out. Yeah, okay. I used to be pretty so, yeah. So okay, y'all know, y'all know the people that, that they're going to line up, they're going to go out there that opening night, midnight showing, and they're going to be waiting in line for four hours before that movie starts, and they're going to be dressed either as a Wookiee or as a Jedi while they're standing there in line to watch a movie. Y'all know those people, right? How much would they be willing to pay for that ticket? A lot of money. Well, isn't it a shame that you got some sucker standing at the door willing to pay $30 to watch a movie and you only sell it to them for eight? So wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if okay, those people that are willing to pay 30 will get 30 out of them, and those people that ain't will, willing to pay 30, well, we'll find out how much they're with the most they're willing to pay, let's get it out of them. And they sort of the movie industry does it based on time. The hardcore Star Wars. Fans, nerds, whatever. The, 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 the hardcore Star Wars people, they're going to be there midnight for an opening night. Make it a party, make it an event, charge them a lot. The people that are like, well, I, I really like Star Wars, but uh, I don't know about all that. Okay. So they're going to be coming when? They're not going to be coming at midnight. They'll be coming a night or two later. But they're pretty serious Star Wars fans. But then you have people that are like, eh, Star Wars, oh, well, whatever. Yeah, I'll see it if I see it. If I don't, I don't. They're not in any hurry to watch it, right? So you're going to have some people that are like, Wait, it's worth it for me to pay $8. If I'm staying here my Jedi Rhodes and I'm willing to pay $8 for you, I'm going to go watch that sucker in the theater 13 times, right? But then you got some people that are like, it's not worth it for me well, 13 times 8, but that's a couple $200 to watch that movie over the couple weeks time span. But there's some other people, it ain't worth me while I'm spending $200 to watch this movie. Yes, people, okay, maybe it's worth $8 for me to watch it one time. Then there's some people that are like, okay, it's 
not worth not being worth it's not worth me paying eight dollars to viewing the show to watch it. Maybe I'm willing to pay five dollars to showing to watch it, so I'm going to wait till it goes not in a good theater, go to that other old theater downtown. Y'all know the one with rip seats and zero and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you only got you only got to pay three four dollars for it. But you got to wait because it's not it's in a good theater for the first few weeks before it goes to the weird theater, right? Yeah, that's good. But then I'm like, okay, I'm not willing to pay four dollars and then drive to downtown to watch that movie. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer. If I wait a little bit longer, then I can go out and I can buy the DVD and I can pay twenty dollars. And I figure I'll watch it four times and so that after that four dollars be okay. Maybe I'll do that. But then there's people that are like, well, I don't even like Star Wars that much. So maybe it's worth me paying two dollars for these four. So I wait a couple months later after the DVDs come out when it shows up on pay per view, and I'll pay two dollars and I get to watch it once. There's people that oh, uh, it ain't worth two dollars piece for me to work. so they wait six more months until it's one of the many many fine quality movies that comes available for their ten ninety nine a month HBO subscription, right? But then there's some people that movies are so unimportant to them they ain't even gonna watch it on HBO they ain't even have HBO they're gonna wait three years from now when a sucker comes out for free with commercials on Fox, right? So those people that are hardcore, want to watch, they're willing to pay a crap ton of money to watch a movie on opening night, movie, we're going to get a whole bunch of money out of them. But those people that aren't as interested, well, as long as they wait a while, we'll get money out of them. But we don't want to, we don't want to have it, have the $20 in theater experience and have it free on a Fox network at the same time, right? Because then nobody, even the hardcore Star Wars fans, they're not stupid. They're going to say $20, zero dollars. They're going to be watching it at home. They might watch it once in theater, but then the rest of the time they'll be watching it at home when it's free on Fox, right? I don't so, know still fans after the last few movies, they might be stupid. Agreed. No, 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 the last two. I like the last two better than the three that came before it. Better than four that came before it. Like, like the prequels? No, uh, the prequels are god awful. Yes. Uh, it actually it went downhill halfway through the third one when Ewoks. What? I love Ewoks. Ewoks ruined it. That's when you jump the shark. The Empire Strikes Back is the best of all of them. And then the first half of Return of the Jedi is okay until Ewoks. What about Revenge of the Sith? No. <laughs> the, I mean, it's okay, nice action, but no. It, they wrote the, 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 the more that they do with all these movies show how they Lucas he did not know what he was doing when he started his talk about a nine movie plan is a crock of and it's obvious and they ruined Dark Slayer as these farther movies come along even the last two movies that Darth Vader's got nothing to do with is undermining the Darth Vader character that was in the prequels that undermines the real Darth Vader. Because I can make a very good case that Darth Vader is utterly inept and not in touch with the Force. I can make that argument, but I'm not going to do that now because it's even comics plus. <laughs> that maybe if I stop in a couple of minutes, I would go through that. But it's just, he's utterly incompetent. What they have done in these, even in the new movies, has ruined what he's done in the old movies. Has just reported he's utter incompetence. Oh. Yeah. 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 I'm jealous. You got money. This discriminated disposable income enough to where not only can you go, you got a laptop laying on your porch, but you still are like, dude, that ain't enough. I'm gonna go to Best Buy and get some other stuff too. I am jealous. I used to be that person. I wasn't complaining. I'm jealous. So price discrimination, charging different people different prices for the same products. Senior citizen discounts, student discount, in-state tuition, matinee prices, coupons, military discount. This is all about selling you the same product, 
But because you are different, we'll get charged you a different price. Coupons, because price is pretty apparently important enough to you that you're sitting there cutting stuff out of newspapers and magazines. That's how price conscious you are, how much you care, how price sensitive you are. So yeah, that's why we're going to sell you this stuff a little bit cheaper because apparently, maybe if it went for coupon, you might not be buying our product. In-state tuition. Any of y'all here from North Carolina? Y'all be sitting here listening to the same whatever 10 minutes about me going off watch Star Wars. The North Carolina person, but they pay twice as much. Y'all are in the same room, same time. Well, part of, well, why? Because your parents have been paying taxes in the state of Virginia and half of the funding for the college comes from the state government. So your parents have been supporting this college for the last 20 years where you can be able to get here. Right. So these are examples where you find out that people that are willing to pay more and you charge them more, you find there's people that aren't willing to pay as much. And you give them opportunities to pay less. Students, y'all ain't got any money, right? So the only way we can get y'all to do stuff is get y'all to do it cheap. And hopefully that y'all get interested, hopefully y'all get addicted, and then when y'all do make the real money, y'all will keep coming. And this is usually for services like sporting events. Like I, I can't keep your student ID as long as humanly possible. When I was in graduate school in Greensboro, the that was the year that the Hartford Whalers moved to Carolina to become the Carolina Hurricanes, and they spent the first year in Greensboro while they were getting the thing in Raleigh up and running. And so I to this time, I was getting into hockey games for like almost nothing. Real NHL game. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I kept doing it for a little bit years here at Burger Court until they moved to Raleigh. They still accept if you do that. Yes, yeah, because they did that. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, it, it, it's the ticket seller, somebody making $8 an hour, and they ain't really sitting there checking the call college and all that kind of stuff. It's not like there's an expiration date on the thing or anything like that. Hold on. Yeah. As long as you reasonably still look like the picture that's on the front of it, you do that thing. They, they don't know if you went to college a little later in life or whatever. This is the thing. And so part of it is establishing relationships. Okay, okay, we're going to let grandma come in and eat cheap. So maybe grandma will come and eat more often. And maybe sometimes grandma will bring you along who's going to pay full price then. Right? So we're going to get a little money out of grandma, which is better than no money out of grandma. And then maybe other people will come in. And it's plus it's establishing goodwill too. Because y'all are like, hey, that's grandma's favorite restaurant. And so y'all go there with her and y'all feel like that, that restaurant treats grandma well. You're more likely to go there even if you aren't with grandma. That's the point of the price discrimination. And as a monopoly, you can do that because customers don't have other options. So it's all about, well, we're going to charge as much as we can because we don't have the threat of competition and as much as we can to different groups. We're going to charge college students as much as we can get away with charging them. We're going to charge senior citizens as much as we can get away with charging them, but we can't get away with charging them the same amount. But we're going to charge them as much as we can. If you're a middle-aged white guy like me, none of this applies, right? <laughs> I'm paying full price for everything. That's just the way it is. Ladies night in the night clothes. Price discrimination. Right? Yeah. Just, there are a hundred different examples that y'all can think of if y'all start thinking about it in the way it was where different people are getting shamed, charged, different prices for the same thing. And especially in other situations like night clothes, restaurants, and stuff, they will do some of this kind of stuff. But a monopoly, can do this just wide open with no, no worry, no repercussion, no, no, just do it because they want to. Get the most money that they can out of you. Go with me? Okay, I'm going to stop there and see y'all next Tuesday, whatever that is.